¿Qué es eso? Espera, 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 espera. Sí, esa soy yo. Y seguramente te estarás preguntando cómo terminé aquí preguntándole a JP Sachs si alguna vez había probado el fuet. Dejad que os explique. Bueno, por cierto, acabo de salir de la peluquería, no sé si se nota. Es que me he visto tan guapa que digo, toca grabar. <risa> Todo empezó cuando recibí un mensaje de Sony ofreciéndome hacer una entrevista a JP Sachs. Sí, sí, el de... But if the world was ending, you'd come over, right? Y... Y también... Así que tras varios ataques de ansiedad, porque no me sentía preparada y me abrumaba un poco, la verdad, preparé algunas preguntitas y nos dirigimos a la sala Razmata. Allí Alex me ayudó con el aspecto más técnico y como el detrás de cámara, cosa que agradeció un montón. Y conocimos al cantante que la verdad fue majísimo, súper simpático, muy transparente, muy honesto, muy cercano y sobre todo me transmitía muchísima tranquilidad, que era justo lo que necesitaba porque estaba nerviosísimo. Además mi inglés está un poquito oxidado, le comenté a JP Sachs que había aprendido inglés eh, viendo entrevistas de One Direction y el chico en plan, por favor señora suélteme del brazo. Pero la verdad es que fue un gusto hablar con él. Después además fuimos al concierto, cosa que fue brutal, o sea fue una experiencia que jamás pensé que iba a vivir que una vez más os tengo que agradecer a vosotros por escucharme por ver mis vídeos por apoyarme por ayudarme por confiar en mí así que como pequeño regalo de vuelta os dejo por aquí la entrevista que le hice a JP Sachs qué fuerte hola chicos estoy aquí con JP Sachs y voy a preguntar algunas cositas sobre su música su arte y a ver qué nos cuenta increíble hola <laughs> I saw YouTube video of yours and you asked a question that you didn't answer and I want you to answer because what someone else yeah what is something in your life that you thought was enough but ended up being a down I say this to people on my teeter totter. Yeah. <laughs> you would think I had a prepared answer because I like to ask people this on my teeter totter. It's a really difficult question. It is a hard question. Yeah. The teeter totter thing's new. <laughs> I still need to finesse it. It's cool. There might be better versions of the question. What's something in your life that you thought was an up but ended up being a down? Oh, yeah. I'll give you an indirect answer. Okay. I have found that the easiest way to ruin my dreams is with my new dream. Okay, that's interesting. I wasn't expecting that. So something that I thought was would be enough was the dreams I had five years ago. Pero ahora mm -hmm. estoy en mis sueños de five years ago. Yeah. Pero ahora yo vivo en mis sueños por five years from now. So you, you never have like enough. It's just like you want well, another step further and I have a step further. If, step you're forward. Fo if you're focused on your ambitions yep. only then you're not focused in the accomplishment or the presence in your past ambitions. By the time you arrive at them, you have new ones too fast. Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about that a lot because I'm currently in my previous self's dreams. What were your previous dreams? This. This. Right now. <laughs> This interview. Exactly. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, kind of. <laughs> you, I know you. It, it feels like a little bit um, silly to suggest, but five years ago, I came to Barcelona. Hey, they told me that is one of your favorite cities. It is. Nice. Five, almost six years ago. Actually, no, six, six years ago, I came to Barcelona in 2018. And it was right after I put out my third ever song. And I was an independent artist and I had no fans and I had very little money and I had no idea what I was going to do with my music or with my life. Mm -hmm. But I knew I wanted to create a life built of, out of songs. Six years ago, while I was here, I wrote the beginnings of many of the songs that established my career. Yeah. Um, and I dreamed about being able to one day come back and play to an audience of people who would give a shit. Like when I was in Barcelona the first time, I went to an open mic. Mm -hmm. And I played songs for people who were paying no attention. I did that thousands of times all over the world. I love open mics. Tonight, I will play some of the same songs I played at that open mic for random strangers in Barcelona, except they bought a ticket. Mm -hmm. That's pretty the action. Really <laughs> welcome. Do you ever get imposter syndrome? See, sí, all the time. Well, why? Because I get in, like, actually during this interview, I'm getting imposter syndrome. Well, I don't know. I just feel I haven't worked enough to be here. To deserve talking to me? Kind of. <laughs> well, that's so dumb. <laughs> yeah, it's so dumb. How do you... If, maybe if I was, like, one of the more famous gingers. Well, I tried to be too bad no, about it. You're faking it, but it's working. <laughs> Fake it till you wake Is it right? fake? Kind of. See, that's a beautiful thing for me, too, because <laughs> when I was very young, yeah. I got made fun of for being a ginger. My dad was ginger as well. Well, he is a ginger. And now yeah. there are people who aren't even a ginger yep. world who are <laughs> leaning into it. Yeah. How do you deal with imposter syndrome if you have? Um, I have no idea. I have absolutely no clue. <laughs> it's, uh, it's challenging because, well, I think part of it is caused by I exist in 
my desire to create whatever is next. Mm -hmm. um, and I also sometimes um, get caught up in thinking that there's a right way to do things rather than just an honest way to do things. Mm -hmm. And the right way to do things is probably the honest one. And then the imposter syndrome is thinking there is some version of a person in your position who would go about this a different way. But the truth is there is a version mm -hmm. of a person that would go about this a different way, but you are not them. And it would be challenging to be that. But I have no answers to this because I haven't <laughs> figured it out. And how did you start singing and making music? I was really bad at everything else. <laughs> You're giving me answers that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> well, I really was. I was very bad at everything else. I was, did very badly in school. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't go to college. I barely graduated high school. But, uh, well, isn't for everybody. No. The Canadian education system, I don't know how it compares um, globally. I'm sure it's better than some and worse than others. But uh, I think it's shaped for a very specific type of brain. Yeah, I agree. And if you don't have that type of brain, mm -hmm. very hard to do well in school. I know. It's very sad for kids who don't have that kind of brain. Yeah, because you, you feel ashamed of yourself. Like, you're just like, I'm not enough. Just because a number on a paper, just describe it. Your intelligence. Right. I have come to a point in my life where I've recognized that it is unhelpful and destructive to be feeling as if I'm not enough at all times. And I recognize conceptually that I likely am, but I don't know how to turn that concept into an internalized emotion. Do you? <laughs> yeah, just panic. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to switch. I'm having I'm an existential crisis. I'll right just now. say on you, <laughs> man, or it's my fault. <laughs> you asked me about my imposter syndrome, and rather than give you an honest answer, I started rambling about other things. It's a defense mechanism. Say, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> who do you admire? Who do you like? Who inspira? Mis amigos, porque yo pienso las las personas ah yo admirado. Si es that the right verb, how do you say admire? Uh, admirado. Admirado. I was close. Yeah. Um, you think you have imposter syndrome. I have imposter syndrome in Spanish, too. Because people think I speak more than I do because my accent isn't horrible. But my accent isn't horrible because I'm a singer and we have to learn how to, like, copy Interesting. sounds. And my mom was Peruvian. Really? Yeah, she didn't look it. But she wasn't ethnically, but she lived there. That's why you learned Spanish? She didn't actually teach me. Oh. I was so mad about it. Because she spoke a bunch of languages and she didn't teach me any of them. Well, I guess she taught me English. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I would have picked that one up anyway. Oh, why did you learn Spanish? What drawn you to learn Spanish? All I say is she died a few years you ago. Go? And then learning Spanish was my way of connecting with a part of her that I never had a connection with while she was alive. So you feel like language is a way of connecting with people, maybe? I think it's the, 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 my best way. Mm -hmm. Not music? To me, the, the music is a mechanism for delivering the words. Mm -hmm. Um, I care about the words more than anything else. And the music is a way of shaping the emotions within the words. They light up the words. I thought you're talking about this. I want to ask, because I'm really interested about how artists make art. Like the proceso creativo, creative process. I want to know, how do you go about making music? I write words first. Mm -hmm. You know, learning Spanish was actually a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting thing to do while writing an album. Because it changed the way I thought in English. Because one of the first things you realize about different languages is that the way you describe emotions is a little bit different. The words for love in Spanish are different than the words for love in English. The well, then in Spanish from here and Spanish from uh, Latin America, si? they, they say te amo and we say te quiero, for example. So you love less. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they say te quiero too, it just means less. Well, in, in Catalan, we're, I'm going to teach some Catalan, we say te estimo. That's the evil. Yep. Is it? It means when you translate it, it's a bit bad because it means like, I want you. Sure. But it means. Yeah, well, means. Yeah. Do you want to teach you some Catalan? Love that. Okay, I have some phrases. Yeah, it. Eh, te estimo. Te estimo. But yeah. that's a way to say it. How would I say it to a large group of people? Uh, te estimo. Us estimo. Us estimo. Yep. Say it again. Us estimo. Us Yep. Estimo. Us estimo. Yeah. So if I said that to the audience, they'd be stoked. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope I, I was a good teacher. Us estimo. Yeah. Us estimo. Okay. Yeah. That sounds right, right? Cool. <laughs> okay, I have some praises for you. First of all, it's one of my favorites because it means like you have to have like um, cabeza and think about stuff, but you also have to be cabeza. like... I love <laughs> I really love this Spanish accent. It's, it's very charming for me, cabeza. Oh, it's because they say cabeza. Cabeza. Yeah, claro. Claro, claro. This phrase means you have to have like a little bit of head and be razonable, but you also have to be like Reasonable. spontaneo. Okay, cool. It is sen y raujo. Sen y raujo. Yeah. Sen is you have to be a little bit thoughtful. Y raujo. Y raujo. 
Irausha means rational? No, the opposite. It's it means like rational. spontaneous, I crazy. I see. Yeah. So it means you have to be a little crazy. A little crazy, but you have to have a little bit of, I don't know how to say like. That sounds like my whole life. Yeah, exactly. That's why I love it because it's, it's, it's like. Senya. Yep. Irausha. Yeah. That sounds a lot like Catalan. If you yeah. want to. It's cool. If, cool. <laughs> if you want to say like, go fuck yourself. Ah. We say like, uh, go stay with mud. Basically, we say, ves a pasta fan. Eh? A pasta. A pasta. Fun. Ves a pasta fan. Yeah. Ves a pasta. And he's like, go fuck yourself. It's so, it's, um, it's very, uh, celebrity. <laughs> say, say it again. Ves a pasta fan. Ves a pasta fan. Yeah. What's the word for something when it's like, um, fe- oh, phonetically. Mm-hmm. Ven a pasta fan. So fun to say. Uh, when we are going to drink and you want someone to drink the whole thing, uh-huh. you say like a phrase that is san hilari, san hilari. Again. San Ilari, San, San Ilari, San Ilari. Fida puta. Fida puta. <laughs> but that's a bad word. That's why I'm laughing. Right. Fida puta, que no se la The first thing I learned how to say in Colombia was infant puta. Well, it, 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 that's... The first fi- thing I learned. Fida puta is hijo de puta. That's so it. you just say, if you don't finish the whole drink, you're just like a son of a bitch. I see. I'm such a bad influence. <laughs> you just... I mean, bad words. I love that you can learn a lot about a culture from the things that you were taught first. So yeah. you taught me how to say I love you, and then you taught me how to say I think irrationally, but my head is on my shoulders while I do mm-hmm. it. And then you taught me how to say go fuck yourself, and then you taught me how to say drink your whole drink. Yeah. So we have love, we have chaos. Yeah. We have, have anger, out- aggressive, and alcohol. Yep. <laughs> Literally. You think those, those are inherently Catalan things? Yeah, and food, maybe. Is Catalan food what I've been eating all day? What have you? Or is Tava Spanish food? It's more Spanish food. I see. What is Catalan? Salsots. It's, it's like an onion, but with sauce, it's really good. It sounds kind of weird, but it's really good. People eat like 50 bucks. I love food in Barcelona, but it's a little challenging for me because I don't usually eat shellfish and I don't usually eat pork. No. And it's all the thing. Yep. Uh, I ate in fue. Yes, it's all It's like a um, embutido. Embutido, you know, right? It's like a meat that you eat in like uh, sandwiches or uh, bocatas. Yes, it's possible. But you don't know if you don't Pam tomatas, bread with sí. tomato. That's Catalan. Sí. Yes. <laughs> it's some <Yeah>. Catalan food. <laughs> it's really good, right? <laughs> and I want to keep talking about your inspirations. Sí, so. And I want to ask about, do you only get inspired by music or do you have other types of art that you get inspired by? Yeah. I find other types of art more inspired for music than other music. How come? Because I don't understand how it's happening. So to just like overanalyze music and you can just enjoy other I experience music like a musician. I experience literature and movies and poems like a person. Yeah, yeah. And it's more inspiring to experience art like a person than it is as an artist. That's very, that, I think that happens. I basically talk about gossip from art and history for a living in, on the internet. That's what I think. Maybe the <laughs> translation of gossip in Spanish might be a different translation than it is in English. Gossip, it's like cotillo, like um, chisme. She's messy. See, but she's making it's a bad rap in English. She's is like, who's dating who? Yeah, that's what I, I talk about this, but uh, with figuras uh, historicas and art. Historical figure. Yep. And that's like, what was Picasso talking. Yeah, basically that's about it too for a living. What did you know? A big Picasso had a lot of lovers <laughs> that See? he didn't treat very. No, I heard he was a total. Yeah, he's a douchebag. Douchebag. Who was who was it? The douchebag. Dali. No, he was also pretty bad. Oh. Mm, well said. Maybe. Mozart? Because the only bad thing I could find about him is that he wanted to date uh, his sister. I'm uh, sorry. His, ah! his cousin. His cousin. Okay. But, but like, historically, maybe. If he, <laughs> yeah. But the way, he, <laughs> the way he was doing, you're going to love this because it's about, it's about writing. Okay. He was writing letters with uh, jokes about poop, farts, and butts, basically. And that, that was his way of flirting with her. To his cousin. Yep. <laughs> he, Mozart flirted with his cousin by talking about poop and fart. Yep. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. That is good historical cheese, man. Yeah. Okay, who do you think was the most moral or ethical historical figure? Maybe the most, maybe a Spanish one or a Catalan one. I don't do know. Do I have any Catalan ones and don't know about it? Uh, Sorry, Dali. so many questions at once. Dali was Catalan? Yeah, Dali was Catalan. Tapias. I don't know if you're not talking. Anyway, Remed- Remedios Varo. She's a surrealist artist. Cool. Yeah. Now, well, you describe yourself like an overthinker and overfeeler. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's kind of like that second word you taught me. Um, uh, <laughs> too much when, when you're having too many feelings mm-hmm. at once you feel overwhelmed by feelings but somehow simultaneously you're also having too many thoughts about those feelings you're both emotionally and thoughtfully overwhelmed at the same time mm-hmm. I think those are the people who like my music I think that's the common element of people who like my song I, I, I like the way you try to relate to your people basically 
It's just like I think that's that we have in com- that's the thing that we have in common, and that's why we relate to each other. I like that. That's kind of beautiful. And I also wanted to ask you about how do you know where's the frontier or the limit between talking about how you feel and oversharing? That that must be difficult because you talk about your personal life a lot, and I don't know if that's hard for you. I think every profession yeah comes with its hazards. So maybe if your profession is an interviewer, mm-hmm. the hazard is having to navigate whether there's anything interesting inherently about you when you're building a life around your questions for others. If you're a hockey player, you have to deal with concussions. If you're a pilot, you have to deal with being away from the people you love. I think if you're an artist, you have to deal with letting people know more about your life than is comfortable at all times. I think if you're comfortable with the amounts you're sharing, you're not sharing enough. Mm, so there's there's a limit when you just like feel uncomfortable about it. No, I think the discomfort is important. I think if, if you were not feeling discomfort, you were not doing your job as an artist. Uh, do you feel like... Uh, sometimes you write a music in a state of mind mm. and that sound kind of like changes with time. Okay, well, two, two thoughts. When you asked me if I was ever inspired by other art forms earlier, yeah. in that thought I just shared about if it's not making you uncomfortable, you're not sharing enough. Mm-hmm. That's something I heard Phoebe Waller-Bridge say in an interview. She's a, a writer, director, filmmaker. She made a mm-hmm, yeah, TV yeah. show, Fleabag. I didn't know that. She did? Mm. Oh. Well, she stars in it too. And I was watching an interview with Phoebe Waller-Bridge talking about Fleabag. Mm-hmm. And she says that she she said in the interview, I'm probably just quoting her, but she said something along the lines of, she knows a scene needs to stay in the edit if it makes her uncomfortable, if it scares her. I feel the same way about lyrics. If they scare me, they stay. Do you keep a journal? No. You should. I, th- it's not uh, hard for me. I tried sometimes, but... What about it is hard? Uh, the consistency. Uh, I'm consistently... Can I, I? I just like uh, sometimes I'm hard on myself. I'm like, oh, I have to do it every day. Just do whatever you want. Do you know what? <laughs> not having done it yesterday is a bad reason to not do it today. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I feel like this is going to be to some very weird because I'm I think I'm very young, but I feel like I've lived my good years. I'm, I'm just like I don't know if there's going to be anything more interesting in the future so that I can write up. Yeah, you in five years is going to think that's weird. Yeah, I know. I think that's a stupid thought. You're going to remember thinking that in five years and be like, wow, now is it dumb? Probably. What are you like? 23? 24. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I just, the thought of like writing how I feel kind of scares me. Maybe. I don't know. That's why I talk that's about why you should do it. Yeah, but I think that's why I talk about gossip from other people, like yeah. Picasso, Larry and stuff, and not about me. You're also dead. Yeah. Hard, they can't argue with you. Yeah. And they would because they didn't probably. expect it. Pro- probably. <laughs> probably. I think one of the beautiful things about documenting the way I felt in moments of time with us all. Mm-hmm is I, I, I don't necessarily re-enter the feeling that I had when I wrote it, when I sing it now. I'll sing songs tonight that I wrote four or five years ago. I'm not going to feel what I felt four or five years ago, but it feels like, and the reason I have to go journaling, it feels like reading my journals from four or five years ago. It doesn't put me back in that place. It almost, it puts me in a new place of recognizing the distance between this place and that mm-hmm. place. You talk about, I feel like, sorry, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> I feel like, your music, you talk about a lot about human connection. Mm. And I wanted to ask you if that also translates to your music. So do you prefer making music alone or with people? Um, I mean, I really love doing both of those things. Um, writing alone feels like thinking to myself. And the art feels like a reflection of my internal dialogue. Whereas when I write with other people, the art feels like a reflection of a conversation. And I think both of those things are valid ways to create. Mm-hmm. Um because some people are the most themselves in conversation with others, and some people are the most themselves when they are alone with their own thoughts and documenting those thoughts. I find different versions of myself depending on who I'm talking to, which is why sort of different songs take on different energies depending on who my collaborators are and the way I speak to them. And don't you ever like feel like scared or like, como que te da miedo, share that with people, and it's just like, I want to talk about the that I have on my journal, a very personal journal, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, most of my collaborators are my friends. So I, I, I make sure that people that I'm collaborating with are people I feel comfortable with. Although there is something inspiring occasionally about writing with a stranger because it somewhat um, it like duplicates, yeah, it duplicates the dynamic you have with the stranger listening to your music. I haven't wrote that uh, question down, but I, I thought I'd ask you because a lot of people have said that you love uh, Barcelona. Sí. Why is that? What, what draws you to Barcelona? Okay, so when I was um, 24 years old, which is how old you are. Yeah. Uh, when I was 24 years old, I this woman I was very badly in love with mm-hmm. broke up with me. She was from here? No. Oh. But uh, after she broke up with me, I decided that I needed to do something I'd never done before. 
because I thought that in order to feel something I'd never felt before, I needed to do something I'd never done before. So the thing I'd never done before that I decided to do was come to Barcelona. You came here alone? I came here with two of my best friends. Okay. That was my first time here. I was here for two weeks. I wrote a song called 25 in Barcelona on mm -hmm. my birthday, which was one of my first big songs. I wrote the beginnings of If the World Was Ending. But if the world was ending, you come over, right? You come over and you say the night. Um, I wrote a song called 4.30 in Toronto, which was the first song on my first album. Mm -hmm. It's 4.30 in Toronto. Um, and I wrote a song called Strangers, which hasn't come out yet, but is actually on my next album. Really? So from, like, what, yeah. six years ago? Six years ago. That, that, does that feel, like, kind of weird or, like, I'm not that person anymore? I don't feel like the person I was when I sing any of my songs. Mm -hmm. It usually takes, like, six to 12 months for a song to go from written to released. Six months? Do you mind? Six months at minimum. Wow. Do you mind um, telling me about what's the process like? Like, two months, right? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, my persons are so stupid. Some songs, they're not stupid at all, I promise. <laughs> What's the... Sorry, I have another question. I'm so sorry. ¿Cuál es la canción que menos tiempo has escrito? Sad corny fuck. I'm just a sad corny fuck. Suddenly, I still don't know what you've done. And how long? In 30 minutes. Pero, that's like three to four months less than usual. Usually they take months. Months? Yeah. Just writing. Oh. Editing. Okay, three months, that, and then? Well, I'll record them, mm -hmm. and then we'll produce them, and then we'll produce them new ways, and then produce them new ways. And the whole process to me is about matching the feeling I received from the art to the feeling I received from the moment I'm duplicating with the art. What's your favorite part? My favorite part? When it matches. Mm. Because it's so mystical when it matches. Because what life makes you feel is a very specific, very nuanced combination of things that you hold in your chest. Something happens, whether it be a moment in a relationship, a moment in a thought process, a, a moment in your life, and, and you, you recognize that feeling. And then I start writing about that moment. If that, if when I listen back or when I read back to what I've created, if it doesn't make me feel the same way as the moment, it's not right. That's... That feels like you have like a lot of pressure in yourself to match that. The fun, <laughs> okay. the fun of it is to is to keep working on it and keep changing little mm -hmm. things to like try and get it to match up. And when it matches up, it's that's why I think people you can experience art and feel like it gives you a window to a part of yourself because I I have fit it to the the moment in my life. And when other people connect to it, it's a recognition for me that I'm having an experience that is not so different than almost everyone else. Even though it feels unique, it feels personal. You know, most of us are experiencing similar things and similar wounds. That's what I like about talking about um, Gus and about art and historical figures, because I feel like sometimes when you go to a museum or you talk about history, you feel like people are very different from us. And then suddenly it's just like people fell in love with the same way. People had mm, heartbreaks and family problems as we all do. So I think that's very beautiful because that's a way we, that we connect. Is your dream dead person interview? For, uh, that's very hard Um, I have two. Okay. One that I don't like, and that's why I want to interview him. And one that I do like. The one that I don't like, it's Dali, because he was kind of like a um, very theatrical person. I've never asked a guest for an autograph on the air before, but I thought it might be interesting to see if you do it in the ordinary way. So I'm just interested to see how that translates. You get one question. What are you asking? Uh, what's real and what's not? If mm. what's real and what's not? Yeah, because uh, mm, Dali, he was he he was a very good artist, but he was also very good at marketing. So if he what's would, real about him? Yeah, not like what what do you think is real and what's not? No, 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 no. What is real about? Him? Yeah, because I feel like he he was very good at like selling things. And I just want to know what, what was real. Because I think it was branding. There there was a lot of branding, right? He said. he he had a bet. Um, Oso Miguero. An Atina? Yeah, he, he he had that as a bet. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. And he also filled a car filled with um cauliflower. He figures all just for the aesthetic. Yeah, not for the aesthetic, but sharp value. And the other person I would love to in sorry. I want to hear your next question, but I also am curious where why you think those things are branding or shock value and not part of his art. 
I haven't thought about that and that makes me change my opinion, I think, a little bit. But at the same time, if you watch his interview, sometimes he did lie just for like the funds of it. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the Ant Theater, he would go around New York with the Ant Theater and the Leech, for example. And that I don't Publicity know. stuff. Yeah. I have a friend who has a similar mustache, and I think he's white. <laughs> Probably. Otra cosa que quería explicar aquí, pero como que no me salieron las palabras, es que pienso que se puede saber mucho de una persona cuando observas cómo trata a aquellos seres que él considera que son inferiores a él. Es decir, en este caso, Dali para su arte maltrata a muchísimos animales como el ocelote, el oso hormiguero, los gatos, etc. Y pienso que si una persona maltrata a un animal es porque él considera que ese animal es inferior a él y que no dudaría hacer lo mismo con una persona si él considerase que la persona es inferior a él. No sé si me he explicado, esa es mi opinión, no sé qué opináis vosotros. And the other person is a woman out of school, Margaret King. She was American, I think, and he had a husband that basically told everybody that the paintings she was making eran suyos. What the fuck? Like famous people. Yeah, hijo de puta. He was like basically selling his art to very famous people and then suddenly one person came to the studio and he was like, oh, so your wife also makes art? And she was like, what do you mean also? I make, like he does, he was also a painter but not a really good painter so she he was basically stealing her art and that's why i went to interview just like to that's cool so she can explain everything and tell her story we found it that's it so nice to meet you muchas gracias i muchas gracias means like uh thank you i know what it means okay but it was muchas gracias oh. muchas gracias muchas gracias yeah si me dicen adeo tu de cámara it means goodbye in cata adeo 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 yeah adeo adeo muchas gracias